Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Okay, welcome back to the Bitcoin Podcast. We have a tremendous interview today. We have Alan Meckler. He's the CEO and founder of Meckler Media. They put together the Inside Bitcoins conferences, which are some of the uh, oldest and the largest conferences for the entire Bitcoin industry. Welcome to the podcast, Alan. Happy to be here. How did you get started in this whole uh, party business? Building conferences, getting these trade shows all put together, bringing together all the businesses and the real players and leaders in this space. Well, that goes back to 1975, the first time I ever did a conference or seminar way, way back uh, before most of the listeners were born. Uh, I was at that time covering microfiche and microfilm for research libraries. And ironically or interestingly enough, if you search in The New Yorker, you'll see it was in the talk of the town. So uh, that was the beginning. And then over the years, I've uh, sort of had my nose to the ground and my eyes open, a little bit of dreaming, uh, always looking for the next big thing. And uh, over my career, fortunately, I've uh, unearthed uh, some uh, really good topics that have developed into major trade shows. What are some of those topics? I mean, as we've talked, you, you've run the real beginning of all the internet conferences. Yeah. Well, before, maybe you can tell some more sure. stories about all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, well, before that, I did the first show in the world on CD-ROM back in the early 1980s. And um, in fact, Bill Gates and Microsoft were impressed with my background. Then I was invited to his house for dinner back in 1986. I had shows on virtual reality uh, in the early 1990s. I was on the Today Show back then. And uh, then virtual reality sort of died, and now it's coming back again as either virtual reality or augmented reality. I did a lot of shows for research libraries, which uh, were called computers and libraries, but I didn't hit the big time really until uh, 1993 when I started a show called Internet World, which was really the first gathering of uh, the, about the commercial internet. And it's really quite fascinating and First one was December 1993, the same day the New York Times ran a story announcing the World Wide Web, because a lot of people don't realize that before the web came along, the internet was uh, not multimedia centric at all. Anyway, that first show where we had a few hundred people and eight exhibitors expanded so that by 1998, we were running it in 20 countries and in the United States in three major cities, getting 75,000 people and four to 600 exhibitors at each one of the cities, New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. Uh, I, I think it became, at the time, fastest growing technology trade show in history. I sold that uh, group of shows in 1998 for about $300 million from starting it from scratch. Nice job. Yeah. And then uh, my other big coup in the trade show area would be starting in 2000, a show called Search Engine Strategies which uh, wasn't quite as big, um, but we, we were running it in eight countries in 2006 when I sold it for about $50 million. In between uh, 2006 and today, I've tried a whole bunch of different areas. Uh, I had uh, at one point the biggest show on uh, social apps, and I was getting 30 exhibitors and eight or 900 uh, seminar attendees and three or 4,000 people, but that died. The trouble with a lot of these technologies, what happens is uh, they don't keep evolving or developing. And when that happens, then people stop paying to go to the seminars. But now seem to be on a hot streak. Uh, over the last uh, 18 months, I've started two different sets of trade shows, one on Bitcoins, where we are today. And then I have the biggest group of shows around the world on 3D printing. We're running inside 3D printing in 10 countries uh, we had uh, 10 days ago here at Javits, uh, over three days, 12,000 people and 90 exhibitors. The show is about five times bigger than it was two years ago when we first started. And that show is, uh, as I said, is, is really leaping by good numbers around the world. 
And uh, in 10 days, we're starting a, our first show uh, called Robo Universe, which is just on service robots. And uh, that is immediately going to be East Coast, West Coast here in the U.S. And uh, it's running in Seoul, Korea in, in June. And we're also running it in Japan and a few other places. So, I mean, it's pretty safe to say that you've got your pulse on what's happening on the ground in a lot of these innovative new technological areas because, uh, you know, the leaders who are actually building things and the companies are paying to come and exhibit at your show. What do you think of the Bitcoin space, the Bitcoin industry in general, the prices down? How's that affecting conference attendance? Uh, where do you kind of see that all going? There are two aspects to running a, a successful trade show versus just a seminar. One is uh, the revenue you obtain from exhibits and sponsorships, and the other is the seminar attendees. What we have with Bitcoins is very much like uh, the beginnings of the Internet uh, in terms of doing a, a seminar trade show back in 1993, where there really aren't significantly large companies uh, or world companies that are in the space. So they're not the exhibitors. The exhibitors are coming from companies that three years ago, for the most part, didn't exist. Uh, they all, uh, many as we know, have uh, significant venture funding. And uh, obviously, the true believers feel that uh, if nothing else, the technology is significant, which I do, the blockchain and, and, and whatever. So I think it's building. But there is another dimension to these shows, and that's paid seminar attendees. And that definitely seems to have an effect on how many people will pay up for seminars. Uh, for example, in December 2013, the second one we ever ran in Las Vegas, we had almost 500 paid seminar attendees. At this show, we'll have about a little over 300. And I think the difference is, is back in December 2013, the Bitcoin had just hit uh, $1,050. <laughs> and now it's 220 or $230. But uh, we're not in it based on the Bitcoin price because we think that that's going to go hand in glove with the development and uh, professionalization, so to speak, of the technology and the Bitcoin use in general. So uh, we stay in the space. Uh, we put on what we believe is the, the best seminar program anywhere in, in the world. All of our programs are programmed by a professional person who is well steeped in uh, what's going on. And my concept has always been, if you build it, they'll come. In other words, if you build a great seminar, you will get the best people. And then if the technology develops commercially, the best people coming to hear those seminars will then attract the exhibitors. So you can't have, I believe, a successful trade show initially unless you have a really good companion seminar program. You hit on a word there, the professionalism that's happening, the professionalization of this industry. I've presented at a lot of different Bitcoin conferences from the very first one in San Jose to ones in Latin America to uh, the one put on by Mo Levine, the North American Bitcoin conference. And, you know, his conference is kind of like, like just a big frat party, to be honest, uh, down in Miami. And then we also have this quasi-journalist, uh, Felix Blabbermouth or something, who wrote an article about how there are no women in Bitcoin obviously discounting all the contributions that people like Blythe Masters, uh, Digital Asset Holdings CEO, uh, Me Dr. Melanie Shapiro, CEO at Crypto Labs, working on the Case Wallet, Elizabeth Rossiello, CEO at BitPesa, who I've interviewed on the podcast, Connie Gallippi, CEO at BitGive, uh, Elizabeth Ploche, she's board of directors at Bitcoin Foundation. I mean, we have a lot of women in Bitcoin. There's also been some talk about, you know... You could add Perry Ann Boring. And Perry Ann Boring. How yeah, can I forget her? I interviewed her for the Chamber of Digital Commerce uh, on the podcast. And so, you know, we have a lot of very capable women in the space. And there's been talk about conferences having policies that you could say are friendly towards the women. Some conferences that I guess have happened in the past have just not been professional environment. At the Inside Bitcoin shows, I mean... This is a well-run show. It seems extremely professional. Like maybe you could tell some war stories about how you've come to really operate your conferences in this professional and business conducive way. That goes with uh, my own personal philosophy 
from the first time I ever ran a seminar conference trade show way back in 70, 1975, I always thought that if you invited people to your home and you were going to have dinner, you, you wouldn't want anyone to say, boy, that was a pretty crappy dinner. <laughs> so, and also the house is filthy. So I, you know, obviously I don't know most of the people who come to my trade shows and seminars, but uh, I want everyone to come in and leave saying, actually, not even perhaps even thinking about it, but if they reflect, they'll say this was uh, really professionally run. And uh, if you only have so many dollars a year to spend on going to one, you're, you're going to pick a Meckler Media seminar versus someone else's because you know it's professionally run and that there's great care been given to uh, not only the production values of running it so that everyone can hear, see, find out where things are, but also that we pride ourselves on getting high-level professional speakers. Uh, and if we hear that the speaker essentially did a, what we call in the trade a dog and pony show and didn't really give out good information, we don't invite that person back again. So in that sense, yeah. we, we try to win over on quality. And uh, even to the extent that we're prepared, which we don't want to do, to lose money on events in, in order to make sure – you know, that there's professional audiovisual, professional seating, professional everything, professional signage uh, from A to Z. You mentioned all these little details that you're taking care of. You know, that's bound to be expensive. With the Bitcoin price kind of down where it is, we're seeing some Bitcoin businesses really struggling. Before we were talking about the interview, you'd mentioned, you know, as long as we keep one oar in the water, like uh, that's where this is going. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? I mean, is Bitcoin just a fad or are you making these investments in running and building this brand and these conferences kind of for much more long-term play? Certainly the latter. The interesting thing about doing the kind of business that I've done over the years is uh, you have to be early and take a big financial risk by even running a show, even the first one, which was in the summer of uh, 2013. We did a one-day event uh, that we just – first time I even heard of the concept, I said that that's a great idea for a show. I had no idea what would happen. We got 140 paid people and three exhibitors. But uh, I could have taken not a huge bath, but you know the risk for renting a hotel in New York City and flying in some people and whatever, AV and uh, whatever uh, – you know, we would, if, if we had to kill the event, we would have lost twenty five to $35,000. So if you wait till it's totally validated, then it's too late because there are a lot of other shows out there. Now, what I've seen over the last uh, two years since I've been in the space, in the Bitcoin space, is that we have attracted a lot of imitators, but many of them were shooting stars and might have, with a higher Bitcoin price, done well, but they've passed by the wayside. As I say, we keep our oar in the water because my belief is that this is something that really has legs, um, that much like the early days of the Internet where there were a lot of naysayers and uh, for every step forward, there might have been two steps back. We're seeing that here as well. So in order to stay in the space, yes, we haven't cut back on any of our production values, uh, the, the uh, facilities uh, that we use. Quite frankly, the only thing we don't provide anymore is a free lunch. We used to literally give lunch to every seminar attendee, but we also charge 50 to 75 percent, even 100 percent more for the uh, seminar uh, fee. And we, we can't do that now uh, because I think what's happened is, is that this is not, again, an industry where there's a lot of money. You have a lot of startups. You have a lot of people that are in school or just out of school who uh, it's a lot of money to, to be able to attend two days to fly into a city uh, wherever we're holding it. So that's where we've made the cutback, but we've never made the cutback, as I said, on production values or seminar quality or, or any of the other factors that I've mentioned. And uh, as I said, I think right now there is a relationship, not in the way the industry is developing in terms of the technology that's moving forward by leaps and bounds. And as I said, increasing professionalization and seriousness on the part of governments around the world. But we do not have as many people coming to the seminars right now because uh, there is definitely a relationship to the price of the Bitcoin, to the seminar price. Yeah, I think it's actually uh, very helpful to come to conferences, not necessarily every single one, but when you've got a good batch of colleagues there, uh, you're able to just get so much business done and make those 
personal relationships and brainstorm about ideas and things to kind of ways to take your own business forward, the industry forward. I got listeners all across the range uh, from, you know, senior lawyers and bankers and regulators to uh, just the kids still in college, like trying to decide what they're going to do. You're a successful entrepreneur. Let's talk to those kids that are either like still in college or a few years out. Like what advice would you have for those new kids that want to build something great that's going to change the world, make themselves a lot of money, add a lot of value to society? It's very interesting. I have met a lot of people in my career, and there are those who want to just follow and have a job and make sure they get a check. There's nothing wrong with that. And then there are the the dreamers and uh, the entrepreneurs who uh, are willing to take a lot of arrows in the back. Certainly, I've taken a lot of arrows in the back over the years and had a lot of failures. I mean, more failures than successes. Fortunately, some of them have been financially so rewarding, it, it's enabled me to go on. It's interesting, and if someone ever did a search on me on, on dyslexia and uh, the uh, on Google and Alan Meckler, you'll, 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 I hate to sort of talk about it, but uh, there's been studies done in, in dyslexics, particularly from my, in my age as a dyslexic when they didn't know I was dyslexic because there was no such term, uh, are used to failure because you're told you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that's how I got into being an entrepreneur. Because I failed at so many things in school, um, I uh, w- I could accept uh, trying something and uh, being defeated, but not giving up because I you know I knew there was something wrong, but I didn't know what it was. So I, I think it's a tremendous advantage. I'm not telling everyone to pray to be a dyslexic, but I think you, there's a lot of pain being an entrepreneur, a huge pain, and uh, it helps to be optimistic and seeing that glass half full. <laughs> You know, or seeing the donut and not the whole. There is a special makeup to it, and the risk reward is what's always appealed to me. I've always been a, a plunger and a quick decision maker based on experience and whatever. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it uh, to a lot of people, but uh, there is nothing more satisfying uh, if you're in a business, I think, than uh, spotting an idea, grabbing it, and running with it, and then seeing it actually turn into something successful. That's, that's the, that's the great high in life. I never did drugs, but can't beat uh, great success as an entrepreneur. Oh, it's a lot of fun. I was actually reading an article in Bloomberg today. It caused me to remember a conversation we'd had uh, months ago. The article was about how Jack Ma, uh, the CEO and founder of Alibaba has kind of inspired a whole new generation of Chinese entrepreneurs And because of the crackdown on corruption, it's actually making the government jobs less appealing. And so the number of people who have actually taken the entrance exam to get a government job is at an all-time low. Could you tell some more stories about like Jack Ma and Chinese entrepreneurship and and kind of this fun stuff? Well, if you're going to let me uh, spread my ego out here, I mean, it it, it is an incredible story. First of all, in my career, I've had one-on-ones with – some pretty significant people, including Bill Gates, two or three times, Steve Jobs, uh, two times, uh, including extra phone calls, which is a, a war story in itself. Uh, Sheldon <laughs> Adelson, the, the, uh, who was a great – he made his fortune, his initial fortune in trade shows, but now is one of the five or six richest people in the United States, if not in the world, with his casinos. Um, but then Jack Ma is one of those uh, incredible stories. Back in 1999, in those days, I was probably somewhat famous uh, as one of the true early developers or person who understood the uh, the internet before most, the commercial internet. And I was uh, invited by an entrepreneur association, so to speak, uh, in Beijing to fly over. They paid my way to fly to Beijing and give a speech to uh, internet entrepreneurs and I remember I got off the plane. It was late at f- like 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, of course, with jet lag and all, though I've had a lot of experience traveling. Uh, the hosts, uh, the two or three hosts, actually picked me up at the airport. In those days, the, the Beijing airport was about 1,000 square feet. It was a center block <laughs> building. This is true. And they rushed me to where this gathering was taking place, and I was in shock. There were about 500 people in the audience. I gave this uh, speech about my experience, some of the 
things that I've just mentioned and uh, how big I thought the Internet was and what it was going to be. Even back in 1999, it had already made some leaps and bounds and uh, invited uh, those in the audience who would like me to look at their business plans that I told them the hotel I was staying at. Well, I got to the hotel and uh, the next morning, uh, well, first of all, starting in the evening, uh, I had to tell the hotel to turn off my phone because every 20 seconds somebody was down in the lobby. People actually camped out in the lobby. Uh, to me, when I came down in the morning, there were 50 or 60 people there wanting to see me. So I, I tried. I was only there two or three days, and I had never been to China before. I wanted to do a little sightseeing. I was with my wife. She was very upset. We were going to go to the Great Wall and Forbidden City. You know, and I got all these people running up to me. So finally, I, I did try to see as many as I could. Lo and behold, one of the hosts, who was an expat from New Zealand, cornered me as I was leaving. He promised me we went out to dinner the last night. And he said, uh, there's a fellow he's advising, and uh, the guy is just heartbroken. He'd been sitting in the lobby of the St. Regis Hotel for three days, and I haven't uh, talked to him. Would, uh, would I talk to him? I said, well, I you know, really got a problem. We're on a 7 a.m. plane to Hong Kong, and I'm giving a speech in Hong Kong, and I'll be there for two days. He said, well, the guy doesn't have much money, but the two of us, would you have a meal with us in Hong Kong? So I said, sure. I said, Who, what's the guy's name? And he said, Jack Ma. This is <laughs> a true story. This was October uh, 1999. I, and I bet you Jack Ma, if I've never seen him again, would, would verify it. Lo and behold, I was there. There they were at 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning the next day at the, uh, at the Mandarin. And I sat with Jack Ma, and, and unfortunately, I don't remember the name. He was like an ex-rugby or player from New Zealand. I hope he got some stock. So I listened to Jack, and I had already made three several hundred thousand dollar investments of people that I had met. Who all, all, all the investments did not work, by the way. <laughs> and there I am with Jack Ma, and if I had just put fifty thousand dollars in, it would be <laughs> worth probably five hundred million. And you didn't put anything in. Well, no, I oh, asked him did? to. Oh, oh no, no. Well, he to told me. He, he, he laid it out for me. He gave me this little, he didn't want me to keep it, but he gave me a quick write-up. I read it, and I said, gee, this looks like an Amazon-type thing. And he said, yes, uh, but for China, you know, for Asia. And I said, I think it's brilliant. I said, I would like to invest. He said, oh, no. He said, I'm not taking any investments right now. I have just raised, I think it was sixty or $80,000 and in China, that will last me a long time. I don't really need anything. I stupidly didn't really follow up on, you know, I probably, oh, no. if I had pressed, but I had just sold my business for several hundred million. And, you know, I wasn't really, it wasn't the end of the world if I didn't make another investment. But lo and behold, he turned me down. But um, he uh, thought enough of me at the time to chase me to Hong Kong, which had cost him a lot. I mean, it wasn't a huge amount of money to fly from Beijing. It's not that long a flight, maybe an hour and a half, two hours. Anyway, that's my Jack Ma story. I, 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 I obviously missed out on, uh, you know, an, an incredible opportunity. Another one, which is a great war story, as some of you may know of a public company today called Shutterstock. The fellow who started that here in New York named John Oranger, I for a while was in the stock photography online business. And uh, he was chasing me around New York for two years, wanting me and my company to put uh, a few million dollars into his business. And uh, the only reason we didn't get, he offered me 49% of the business for $5 million. This was in late 2004, early 2005. And because I was a public company at the time, and I wanted to, as if, if no, uh, one knows the accounting rules, I uh, wanted to consolidate revenues. So you needed 50.1%. So I held out and didn't do it. That investment today would be worth somewhere between eight hundred and a billion, eight hundred million and a billion uh, dollars. Good gracious. Yeah. So I've had a few of those actually. I almost owned. Uh, I had a shot at Yahoo in two thousand five with uh, David Philo and Jerry Yang at dinner. And again, same thing. I wanted to make it part of my public company. They went with Sequoia and invested there, but they were making the decision that night which way to go. So it was a very foolish thing I've learned subsequently with a public company. If you see a great idea, be happy to take 10%, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, I left uh, probably 2 or $3 billion on the table. Can't, but they're great war stories, yeah, if nothing can't, else. Can't. All I have is fish, <laughs> great fish tales or war stories, but they are true. And those, all those people, uh, well, Steve Jobs isn't alive today, but they're all around to uh, – 
you know, verify if anyone wants to try to do that. I even worked for Robert Kennedy for two years in the 1960s. So I've, I've, I've gotten to meet a lot of interesting people. Yeah, well, I suppose the real fun is is being being down on the basketball court and not in the stands. Watching, yeah, you know. <laughs> well, as one of my idols, Theodore Roosevelt, said, "It's the you know, it's the it's the person in the arena, you know, who who really lives the full life when you're mixing it up and um, you know versus the person sitting on the sidelines." Well, you know, it's been a just an excellent interview. Thanks so much for taking the time and the attention to give. Uh, everybody some insight and perspective and experience on just everything that's happening. We've had Alan Meckler, CEO and founder of Meckler Media with us today. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or a suggestion? Record your voice at Bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share Bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate. Yeah.